<clears throat> Hello? Yeah. Hi. Um, if anyone can't see, there's actually still room up the front if you're okay sitting on the floor. Um, the easiest way to get around is to walk around the back. Uh, my name's Meow. For those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, founder of BioFoundry Australia's first open access molecular biology lab. I'm a pol politician with the Science Party, and I'm also really interested in non-currency applications of the blockchain. Before we get started, I might just um, do a bit of a uh, shout out to see who knows what about everything, just so we know how to, uh, panelists know how to gauge the technicality of our talks. Could you put up your hand if you have cryptocurrency? Oh, so that's really good, that's really good. Um, <laughs> now's a great time to buy. <laughs> Uh, and um, uh, could you put up your hand if you think you understand the blockchain in great detail, or what the blockchain is? Could you say, okay, uh, a medium understanding of the blockchain? Zero understanding of the blockchain. Okay, cool. That's really informative. Um, what I might do now is I'll pass the microphone along. I'll get each of the panelists to give a short introduction about themselves, and then um, I'll uh, ask some questions and get the panel started. So I might start over this way. Um, I'm Nicole Lindner, I'm from Unisys, I'm the Industry Director for Asia Pacific for the Financial Services Practice. So, unlike Meow, I actually have a great interest in blockchain in terms of cryptocurrency and financial services generally, but I also am really interested in blockchain in terms of its applications to business generally, um, in particular the supply chain. I'm really interested in how it can work for health services, uh, technology, and also actually potentially replacing, you know, the, the systems of government and exchange that we have at the moment. So as a, as a revolutionary um, working subversively within the corporate world. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. Good evening, everybody. I'm Cindy Nicholson. I work for Optus and um, I work in the Optus business area and I run the financial services industry sector. Um, I have a passion for innovation. It's been a common theme throughout my career. I won't tell you how long that's been going because that will really give it away. But anyway, I'm sure my face tells it all. Um, but I have built a digital identity platform for real-time digital identity verification. And what I'm really passionate about is how we can then put that into the blockchain and make it a reusable identity verification so we can protect everybody's identity in this room and, um, and make your lives a lot easier. So that's one of the things that I'm really passionate about about. So I'm looking forward to tonight. Uh, so my name is Max K and I, I guess uh, the easiest way to describe what I do is I design blockchains and currencies. Um, this probably doesn't manifest as you may expect. Um, I've been in blockchain for about seven years and about two years ago I founded a political party with uh, this man here, Nathan. Um, we founded a party called Flux that uses a new system of democracy that is sort of actually more like a currency than a traditional voting system. Uh, my day job at the moment is working for our startup, X01, building a product called SecureVote that does uh, decentralized governance for token operators primarily. Um, we can do all kinds of things like elections and stuff, uh, but that's what we're focusing on at the moment. Um, so yeah, I've been around the block, ran a mining pool back in 2011. I was an early Ethereum developer in late 2013, early 2014, um, and a whole host of other stuff. So really looking forward to tonight. So my name is Li Ming Zhu. I'm a research director from Data61 CSRO. Um, for people, CSRO is Australia's national research agency. And Data61 is its ICT data um, digital business unit. We do a lot of research in the blockchain space, uh, both at the blockchain level, but intersection with other business uh, use cases, like in health, um, food, agriculture, and et cetera. Um, I also have another role. Um, I'm the uh, chairperson of the uh, Standard Australian Blockchain Standard Committee. And, and as you, some of you know, Australian is really leading the international standardization uh, through ISO on blockchain standards. Hey, I'm uh, Nathan Waters. So background is uh, Hackagong. I started in Wollongong. It's one of the, lar the largest uh, hackathon competitions in Australia. Um, pretty involved in Bitcoin pretty early on. Was mining them when they were a bit under a dollar. And I started the, the Sid Ethereum meetup, which is a monthly meetup to discuss Ethereum. Uh, it's pretty, pretty big now. We get like, we have to cap it at about 150 people and we get like, you know, 100 on the waiting list. So that's pretty fun. The last one was just on Thursday. Um, and my current blockchain project is Peerism, P-E-E-R-I-S-M. It's basically a project to overthrow capitalism because capitalism sucks. Um, so yeah, go look that up. 
Awesome. So we've got a really great uh, panel of panelists. Uh, everyone has heaps of experience. We might start with uh, some of the currency applications, and then in the last half, we'll move into the non-currency applications. We'll see how it, how it is. So I might start with, um, we've just seen things like Bitcoin go into a bit of a free fall after everyone's saying it was a bubble. What do you think it says uh, about uh, cryptocurrencies when a country can ban something like an ICO and then have, have such a big effect? And what does this say for future, if future countries choose to do the same thing or the opposite, maybe say they adopt it? Um, any thoughts on that? And I'll keep one microphone on this side, one microphone on that side. You can hold on. So um, do you, do you, uh, do you want to jump in? No, no, do you want to get me to take that one and I'll, that yeah, way yeah. you can continue to talk or do you want to leave it? Yeah. Yeah, I, I try my hardest not to talk. So, uh, so yeah, what, what does, what does uh, China's yep. uh, ICO banning mean for cryptocurrency and blockchains in general? Look, I think that China is a bit of a law unto itself. So, so I think that anything that happens in China is watched very eagerly by the rest of the world because it's such an economic force and, and has the ability to move markets. But ultimately, you know, China is not really a democracy. So they can do things like ban it's, it's a currency. <laughs> <laughs> well, they like to pretend. They like to pretend that they are in, in some ways. But, but when it comes down to things like blockchain, you know, we're really seeing the, the hard line coming in there. And the protections, I think, that the, the Chinese will put around blockchain and you know, develop their own currency. I think this is all about sovereignty. I think this is all about China. I think it's not about playing well with others. Um, they are the, you know, apple of the world. You know, they don't play well with others. They want to have their own um, currency. And also I think, too, what's really interesting is that there is still, you know, a lot of suspicion with the Chinese about open data, open transfer, all that sort of stuff anyway. So you see, you know, when people go to China and they open Google and you go there and it's like there are three pages mm. on Google. And it's, it's, it's a little bit disconcerting for us who have, you know, access to information, who have access to, to movement of information. And I think that one of the things we've got to look at is how is China actually going to influence the rest of the world in terms of this move? I, d I don't think that any of the Western economies will ban blockchain. I don't, I don't think that... And I think that it will come back up for those of you who are shorting it. Um, I think that it will definitely come back up. And I think that it's here to stay. But I think that this is a, a demonstration that, you know, sovereign, sovereign states can still wield enormous influence on it. So I guess um, uh, maybe I'll take a slightly different tack. Um, hands up if you've ever participated in a token sale or the poorly named ICO slash initial coin offering. All right, so, oh, okay, there's only, like, there's, like, eight people. That's, okay, anyway. Um, for, those peop for those eight of you who put your hands up, how many of you have read the T's and C's? So, literally, wait, maybe two? Two and two, a half. Two, and very half. hesitant. Yeah. Two, <laughs> two and a half. Um, you mean the white paper? No, 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 I mean, I mean the, like, the like, the eight pages you have to scroll through and all the check boxes that you have to tick before they give you the, you know, the address or the whatever else to send money to. Um, so, every recent token sale has a little box, or pretty much every recent token sale has a little box saying, I confirm I'm not a US citizen. Uh, people will check that regardless of whether they're a US citizen or not, and the reality is that we're dealing with a pseudonymous form of money where states can't stop it. There's no way to freeze your account, and it doesn't matter what a state does, they're very quickly going to find that trying to just ban something they don't like is not going to work, because the people who are interested in that are keep going to doing it, like keeping... You know what I mean. They'll do it anyway. That, um, that kind of applies to everything because when, when, when you run... Put up your hands if you run for politics. Is there a little box that said, I'm an Australian citizen? Uh, <laughs> so I, I don't actually know if there... I don't actually know if there is. I mean... I think there is. There might, might be, but... but uh, so <laughs> technicality section 44 is to do with like foreign powers and stuff and they don't ask you that much. So anyway. Ask Barnaby Joyce. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Well, to be honest... To be, anyway, I won't go into that. <laughs> I shouldn't derail the conversation as the MC. I think, I know, I think it's fun. <laughs> it's good. But does anyone else want to jump into the, China, the, the latest thing that happened with China banning ICOs? Uh, sure. Um, so the people who created blockchain in the beginning, uh, they were crypto authoritarians or libertarians. Like, by design, it's intended to be anti-government, anti-centralization. Like, it's, the whole point is, like, hands up who's heard of, like, the decentralization movement here? Like, the word decentralization. 
Yeah, so yeah. it's pretty. Yeah, it's pretty much it's synonymous with blockchain. Um, I'm not sure a lot of people really quite understand the the meaning of that or the or the importance of decentralization. Like I use it all the time, like a flippant kind of a uh, kind of word. Um, but really, like most of our society is centralized. Yeah, like you know the central government, all the power kind of rests there. Corporations are centralized. The, the, all the all the power and wealth rests there. It's what blockchain is. It's a it's a Trojan horse in society and capitalism to essentially decentralize to give power back to individuals. So that we move towards more of a network society rather than these hierarchical kind of pyramidal societies. And so it, it really doesn't like it doesn't matter what companies and corporations do. Um, and you won't be able to regulate this. You can put rules in place, but there'll, there'll be so many ways around it because it's by nature it's decentralized. Thank you very much, because that leads into my next question. We actually went faster than I wanted to to get to here. <laughs> but, um, so, we always talk about how good this is uh, going to be for the world and we're going to decentralize anything, but we know that there's cryptocurrencies like Ripple that are centralized cryptocurrencies. So my question to the panel is, what ways might blockchain be used negatively? So how could it be used to control? How could it be used as an efficient way of doing things that we might not be aware of? And how might governments and corporations use that as um, nefariously? So just as a counter question, how, is, how can BitTorrent be used negatively? And I think that's, it's a very difficult question to answer because th what we're talking about here is a protocol that's essentially based on free speech. Like we've, we've turned money into information which, of course, it always was, but it required extra stuff. And we've just stripped away all that extra stuff. Now we've just got information. And you can support this entirely on free speech. And so in terms of using this negatively, I mean, besides, like, forcing people to use one thing, uh, which we already do, um, or, I, I mean, that's sort of it, is you can just force people to use a protocol, but we already do that. So... Oh, I've got ideas. <laughs> oh, well, there we go. Maybe... Well, let, <laughs> let me out talk about his... Um, I'm interested to hear whatever to say that. Have you thought about this? Negative uses? Yeah. Oh, shit. Does anyone know about Sesame Credit? <laughs> Sesame Credit? Have you... So China has a social rating system yeah. there. They're starting oh, yeah. to, to, out, to roll out where literally every single Chinese citizen will have a score. Um, a little bit like, have you, have you seen that Black Mirror episode where they're, they're kind of rolling on the treadmill and getting the scores? And, mm -hmm. and even the one, there's the other one where they're like, you know, if, if your score's too low, then people don't want to hang out with you. So China, the Chinese government, is literally fucking implementing that on all of their citizens without, like, like compulsory. So they're saying that you'll have a certain score, and if you hang out with uh, people who are, say, anti-government, your score will go down. <laughs> And on top of this, they're also, so China, Singapore, um, Russia, and a bunch of other countries are, are exploring issuing their own uh, sovereign currency by, through their central banks in a form of crypto. So there'll be like a crypto yuan. So imagine Sesame Credit plus crypto yuan. You, you're essentially not only uh, have, giving a social score to every single citizen and, and limiting what aspect and freedoms they have, but you're also tracking their entire purchases and everything they do within that economy. Um, yeah, there's a lot of crazy yeah. shit that can happen. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I think coming from a government agency, <laughs> it's hard to imagine we can think of anything uh, very uh, negative. But uh, when we come up with all the positive scenarios of blockchain in, in our treasury reports, you know, supply chain, uh, 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 data registry, and uh, remittance, international remittance, certainly we also identify the risks. And the risk section is really... Uh, indicating if it's not used properly, it can be used uh, quite negatively. And the, in the daily interaction we have, and um, we people want to use put health data um, onto blockchain. You know, Australian is driving the digital health record, uh, my health record, and by by probably late ne next year, it will be opt in by default. Um, so there's a, going to be a lot of risks as people starting to share this information and potentially have a blockchain uh, use case scenarios. But I think one way to resolve that, probably is the wrong answer for this audience, is, well, we have regulations around it. I mean, back to the ICO, ICO um, discussion earlier. Well, basically, whether ICO is a security, people say, what, you know, whether when you sell your token, whether you pay taxes, and when you have pre-sales of your services, is that revenue recognized on the point of sale of token, or on the point of you convert to real currency, or on the point of service provider? These are all legal questions, and I think um, the regulation sometimes is protecting the consumer, but on the other hand, um, I think the technology is neutral in some way that we need to understand its use cases and the regulation around it uh, to help uh, the, the technology itself to be beneficial. 
I, I love the point about um, you know the policies and so on, and it's a it's it's a free for all, so everybody's just going and, and buying current, um, cryptocurrency, and off you go. But um, I, I'm a member of the Australian Digital Currency Association, and one of the things that we look at are all of the different types of use cases across different industry sectors. And um, not only that, we're looking at all the policies and regulations around that. And one of the things that we actually managed to do was to get the GST removed from um, cryptocurrency. So I think um, if you think about <laughs> if you think about some of the negative things, maybe that's negative for the ATO, but you know, maybe it's not so much for the individuals. <laughs> Just curious, I have a question. So, what, what's the difference between digital currency and the tokens in ICO? Is that a difference? Are they are the same thing? So there's. Yeah probably implications when you remove the uh, tax G GST on, on digital currency or also removing all the um, ICO potential tax implications, which makes Australia a, a potential place for a lot of investment or uh, incorporation of that. Yeah, I guess if you, if you put it into the plain, simple terms of it being a digital asset, um, then that digital asset can be anything, whether it's currency, whether it's a share, whether, it can, whether it's an ID, whether it's um, something you're giving to charity. Yeah. Just, yeah. So um, I think the idea is really to make sure that you don't double dip. That's really what it's all about. But, but also I think too, on, on the government note, I spend um, two weeks of every uh, two months in Singapore and it's a very interesting place. It's a bit like stepping into a um, really controlled environment where, you know, it, it starts with, you know, the... the the paperwork you have to fill in when you go in, the the, the retinal scans, everything else that, that every Singaporean citizen actually has now. So they, they actually go straight through um, immigration now because their retinas are actually being stored by the government. So even if you go within the airport at Changi between flights where you actually don't have to go through immigration again, they actually are now starting to scan. So the level of control is, is extreme in Singapore. I also think because they have the centralised um, monetary authority of Singapore as well, that's directly controlled by the government, and also um, the Temasek Corporation, which is the number one investment fund in Singapore, is actually controlled by the Lee family. So you have got an incredible centralisation. Singapore is actually an incredible example of a totalitarian state masquerading as a democracy. And what I think is really interesting about Singapore is that it is a, a, an economic miracle. They have got a lot of good things that they like to, to talk about, but the things they have given up for that are significant. And when Lee Kuan Yew actually said, you know, we're going to break from Malaysia, we're going to have our own state, it will be tough, but in order to do so, you're going to have to give up certain things as citizens. And those things are creeping up in number because technology has enabled that. So freedom of speech and, and things like that are, are virtually non-existent. And now you might have also freedom to purchase also being non-existent. So I think it is an interesting example. It's very close to us. It's seen as a, a, a model you know, a economy. It's seen as somebody we always think, oh, you know, digital adoption rates sky high. The fact that, um, you know, there are more mobile phones than people in Singapore makes it really, really easy for the government to track them. So that's just another thing you have to think about when you're there. So getting back to uh, what Nathan was saying about the possibility of China uh, essentially giving people, like, pro-China points type thing on a blockchain um, and moving finance onto a blockchain, the, the thing about state-sponsored control is that it's not just about the information that people have access to, it's about the information that you release. And the thing is that right now, I can't build a protocol that ever depends on someone's, say, like bank balance and yuan in China. As soon as that goes on a blockchain, I can. And I can start building, block, I can start building blockchain applications outside of China that depend on that. And that's, that's very risky. Right, the benefit of a blockchain, and what makes a blockchain a blockchain, is this idea of a single history. Right, within central banking, within all our existing finance systems, that doesn't exist. But in the blockchain world, it does. Now, if China goes and builds a blockchain to do this sort of stuff, then, and I can now build a protocol 
that behave that changes its behavior based on what happens in that Chinese economy, then I can enable, for example, an exit strategy for people in China. I can build a path out that I couldn't build before. And so I don't think that blockchain at all can be used for this kind of evil. Like I think blockchain is an amazing, like it is, it is fundamentally an anti-statist technology, as in it is anti-state. And ultimately we will see that all of the pro-state uses become phased out over time. Um, this might take decades, that's fine. But that we're going to move towards a situation where f it's far more about the freedom of information and by digitizing everything that we have and by turning everything that we have into information, right, from that freedom of information, we, like, as humanity, will flourish in a way that we never could with, like, s the oppression of states like China. So... Anyway, maybe that's a counterpoint. I'm going to chuck that back to and then. basically, that a, a centralized database always does a better job. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely uh, agree that. Um, uh, I wrote a blog post that got pr went pretty well called "Blockchain Commons." If you look it up, it's pretty cool. Um, and I basically basically said that the the reality we're likely to end up in first is this crypto authoritarian kind of centralized reality where everything's, you know. Uh, corporations are just looking to cut costs and, and, and kind of make the, their backends more efficient, so they'll decentralize their backends on private blockchains um, that you can access through their UIs and through their brands. And the same thing possibly with, um, with central banks. Like, I think they'll probably, like, they'll, they'll try and make private blockchains as much as possible when they issue their, their sovereign cryptocurrencies. But definitely I agree that in the long, so in the, in the short term, it's just going to be more state control, more corporate control on private blockchains um, and more trying to hold on to that data because that's kind of the only business models that, that corporations tend to know is, is make data scarce when it wants to be free. Um, but yeah, hopefully eventually you'll get to the point where, where public blockchains uh, kind of have the network effect that uh, kind of private monopolies have right now. Like, you know, Facebook's winning right now not because of competition but because of the network effect because they have all your data locked into, into their servers, they have all your friends locked into their servers and so that's the best place to go. But ultimately, a decentralized social network or a decentralized Uber or a decentralized insert company, insert service will have the network effect because they will be building a protocol that other people can build on top of and every new bit of data and user that goes into that is, is beneficial to the collective. So long term, I think it will lead towards a more decentralized future. But short term, crypto authoritarian dystopia. <laughs> Something to look forward to. Um, so, so on that, um, we might move. So, we're about, we're about halfway through. We're going to move into the uh, more non-currency applications of the blockchain. So, what types of non-currency applications might help us get through that crypto authoritarian period and into this uh, cyborg utopia? This feels like one for Nathan. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, basically, like any any non-currency application that you think uh, is going is going to take us there. I don't know. I'll, Sorry, get, I'll I, get one from everyone because there's some interesting ones. But on oh, Nathan's, it's, yeah, there we go. Yeah, uh, I guess I'll, I'll kind of like briefly pitch what Purism is trying to be. It's it's still very abstract and still trying to build it. Um, running it as like a, a decentralized open source organization. So if anyone wants to help out and get involved, they can. But what I want to basically do is rather than uh, tokens literally just being a, a a value of money, essentially, like in Ethereum, you know, Ether's worth 400 bucks, Bitcoin's worth $4,000, that seems to be all people really care about. Instead, I want to flip that on its head and say that, okay, well, what if we um, made skill tokens represent people's, uh, oh, sorry, tokens represent people's skill levels. So we all have skill sets that are varied, but usually we do one job for, you know, if you're an accountant, you do accountancy 40 hours a week, and that's pretty much all you're known as, but, you know, Accountants might be good at photography or marketing or design. They might have a variation of skills, but our economy is really dumb and doesn't, isn't aware of that. And so when automation destroys accountants, which I hope it happens like soon, uh, <laughs> why do they still exist? Um, ideally, if we had a system where um, they weren't just an accountant 40 hours a week, instead they had, you know, they had maybe 50,000 accounting tokens that represent their skill level, a bit like a role-playing game. But maybe their next fallback, when that gets automated, they might have 20,000 you know, marketing tokens, and that represents their skill level. And the next one might be you know, 10,000 uh, 3D printing coins, and they might have 2,000 fidget spinner tokens. Like, literally any <laughs> skill set you can imagine. And we, we end up kind of quantifying people's skill sets, almost like a decentralized resume, instead of this bullshit of like, you know, endorse me on LinkedIn, which means nothing, or 
you know, you get a doctorate degree in India, it doesn't transfer to the US, or you get a badge on Khan Academy, you can't transfer it to Udemy or Coursera. If we had a decentralized system where these, where these cryptocurrencies actually represented your skills and your skill levels, you could do, start doing amazing things like matching tasks directly to people, cut out every single middleman, uh, and just go direct task problem to person solution and have a more networked peer-to-peer -peer economy. Um, so probably I mentioned earlier already, so one of the things like this, the, what Nathan just said is a specific example of so, sort of like a data registry uh, of, you know, regarding personal skill set. Um, so that's one of the three uh, top scenarios we identified in our treasury projects is a data registry. Because what is the reg difference between registry and a database? Registry is like high quality data, authoritative data, which uh, represents something around skills or anything of value. And the, 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 the immutability and uh, integrity of those data are very important. And who can verify it? As a citizen, you may want to verify it yourself to make sure the data reflects you know, your personal data is true over there. And there's other authorities probably can verify as well. So data registry is one of the examples. Another thing um, we identified is food providen provenance. Reason being, um, what can blockchain benefit in Australia? Um, so one of the key uh, Australian economy is, is about uh, food export. You know, Australia being the uh, food basket of Russia, uh, sorry, Asia, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> exporting all the uh, food to, 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 to China. <laughs> yeah, and all the counterfeiting um, uh, challenges we're facing in that one, uh, especially, especially Australian premium food. So that's another scenario we are exploring. Um, so I guess when I said this feels like one for Nathan, I forgot about my own project and reason for living. Um, so uh, I, I, when I helped co-found the Bitcoin Association of Australia, my bio at the time said that I was really looking forward to new types of communities that couldn't exist without blockchains. Um, and Flux and the system of democracy that we're creating is, is that. Um, it is a system that cannot exist without the sort of flexibility and, the, and essentially the trust you can have in a system based on a blockchain. And basically it's a, way for, it's a way for people who are interested in causing political change to engage in a system that almost guarantees that they always move in the direction of progress. Um, and this is pretty, pretty important because progress means solving problems. And so, you know, from, from my point of view, Blockchain enables us to, in, like, to encode systems that could not exist without it and that because of our understanding via, you know, in this case, um, epistemology and economics and political theory, we can encode a system that essentially pushes people in that direction and that it's a type of system that can't exist without blockchain. And so in terms of non-currency uses, I mean, I feel like this is probably a pretty big one. Now, the counterpoint to this is that we essentially, you know, use tokens and manipulate tokens in order to use this, and that is in many ways a currency. It's not a monetary currency, but it's a currency. Um, and so there's maybe a philosophical point or question here about, you know, is, is all that we ever do with information, does that eventually unify with, a, with the idea of currency? Um, that's maybe, if anyone's interested, maybe a question to ask later. We'll buy you a drink. And then yeah. <laughs> many drinks. Yeah. So many, many th um, use cases go through my mind, um, and we've heard about current. We've heard about countries. We've heard about politics and banks and so on. What about the consumer? What about every one of us in this room? Um, can I just get a show of hands of whoever has in, has given money to charity? And how many of you know exactly where that money ended up? Look at that. There's a prime <laughs> example. So. What if you could give money to charity and you could trace exactly where that money went and if you've given some money to um, a child to have a year's worth of um, education, how do you know that that's actually where it ended up? That is a massive, massive benefit, um, a, great a great opportunity for blockchain. I know personally I'd probably give two or three times as much money if that were the case. Um, other things that come to mind, land titles, uh, Papua New Guinea is um, quite a, a you know, old country, backward country, but they are going completely digital. Mm -hmm. There will be land titles, currency, everything. Um, other examples, you know, health, we talk about data. Um, and I think this also goes 
in a much bigger ecosystem than just the blockchain. Because when you think about what's happening with artificial intelligence, what's happening with open APIs, what's happening with open data, all of these components are actually serving as part of what's happening within the blockchain as well. But, um, I mean, essentially the blockchain is the means to be able to trace the um, activities of a digital asset, whatever that digital asset is. Um, many people download music off uh, pirated sites, right? What about the poor artists? They're going out and having to do concerts all the time to try and get their money and their, their, their music's being pirated and, and downloaded. What about all the people who are the scalpers who buy the tickets and then on sell them? Why are they making that money? Why is that not going back to the artist? So how can we trace all of those things? I mean, when you start to think like that, it really does open up your mind to realise the potential of what this has, and I think it's really going to change the world. And we've, we were just talking earlier that our, our children are in a similar sort of age group, um, and I've been speaking at my daughter's school recently, and I've another, another talk coming up um, soon, and it's really quite profound when you think about what they're teaching them, accountants, they're teaching them, you know, accountancy, lawyers, um, teaching them law and so on. But those jobs are actually changing. Yeah. So lawyers now need to know how to code because actually artificial intelligence is going to know all the information that they need to wow. know about the law and they're just going to be the ones that interpret. And so, so essentially, you know, this whole digitalisation, um, blockchain and everything that goes with it is just going to be, um, have a massive impact. So, um, You touched on um, crime prevention. Um, you know, a lot of people focus on blockchain because it's got the, because Bitcoin is, is used on the dark web. And so, therefore, blockchain is is sort of, you know, bracketed with that as something that enables, you know, sort of master criminals to, to manipulate the web. I actually see huge, huge benefits for law inf enforcement and particularly in terms of controlling drug mm -hmm. uh, trafficking, uh, human trafficking, you know, all that sort of stuff. The, the blockchain can actually, because of its transparency, mm -hmm. you can actually trace back yeah. every interaction. You know, what now goes through, you know, maybe... 200 middlemen or, or 200 middle sites or false false accounts or, or false identities can actually be traced. And for things like health services in particular where perhaps medical histories need to be accessed extremely fast, where blood products need to be moved extremely fast, you know, you no longer need these centralised clearing databases. The blockchain can take care of it. So definitely the, the plus side for society is massive, but like the internet, we don't want it to turn into something that's just got bloody ads in all over it. And, and you know, it's like, oh, you know, you bought, you know, this, so therefore you want to buy three of that and, and stuff. Now, that, I that for me, I, I, I'm very concerned that, you I know. joined Coinbase and all of a sudden my Facebook feed is filled with bo Absolutely. every single ICO. Absolutely. Science coin, dentist coin, anything you can oh. think of. Now, yeah, on that... Dentist coin, that sounds great. <laughs> I mean, I'd, I'd rather <laughs> have the like dystopian cyborgs Ethereum. than the like, bloody advertising. Um, so on, the, on that note as well, um, you touched on something really important. Um, we might make this the uh, maybe last or second last question and then we'll chuck it out to the audience. Um, uh, what does what does digital digital identity mean in the world of the blockchain? Okay, so I, I was hoping you'd start. Yeah, yeah, no, no. <laughs> oh, look, this is my passion. I love this. I love this topic. So, I mean, every one of us in this room knows that if you go in and buy, and I'll talk about Telco, of course, um, if you go in and get a new SIM card, you have to produce your driver's license, and that's a necessity under the anti-money laundering regulations. Um, as is the same Except as if you, you go... work at CBA. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this is the next week. you want. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, when you open up a bank account, you have to produce that and more. So the point is, though, when you've gone and opened up a new account with a telco and you've given them your driver's licence data, why do you then have to pull that out again and give it to somebody else the next time you do another transaction? Why can't you have a record that says this individual was verified successfully using this particular piece of information and these are the verified relevant attributes that they need in order to take on this new service? And if you've got the collaboration and the warranting behind that, 
then it starts to build it up, right? That's the first point. And then we talk about LinkedIn and we talk, talk about maybe universities, for, for example. Universities are really frightened because people are claiming that they have all these different degrees and so on and they're actually not validated. So there are universities in Melbourne that I've spoken to who are enabling a verification of that particular qualification. Now, why can't that go onto your digital ID as well? So then you as the consumer, you decide what information is actually collected about you, who your Facebook friends are, um, where do you travel to, any, any information that's relevant to build up a picture of your trust um, is really, really important. And then you decide what parts of that information you share with whomever you choose for the particular job to be done. And the reason that this is such a profound change is that typically we would have brought out a passport or a driver's licence because it's from a government or an institution that we have typically trusted and it's in a paper form. We don't live in the paper form anymore. We live in a digital world. And the Elderman report now shows that people have more trust in peer-to-peer -peer than they do in these institutions. So why are we not embracing that and using that to actually really create trust as us, for us as an individual? Does anyone else want to comment on digital identities? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, jump, yep. in, jump in. Um, so I guess on the one of the university topics, so we were actually talking earlier tonight about how, um, or at least I expressed something that I feel is a shame, which is that uh, government never started offering cryptographic identities. Um, as in, quite easily, from the 90s, they could have just said, okay, every driver's license has you know, a QR code or a barcode or something like that that has a signature saying, you know, this driver's license number, this person, sign it by, uh, with a central, like a, a central government key, essentially exactly the same that we've done web certificates for the same time, and you could buy them for, you know, under $100 then. Um, that was other reasons for why they were $100. They're essentially free to produce. Um, we could have started this at any time, right? I don't, I don't believe, when universities say, we don't want fraud with our degree thing, I don't believe them, because they could have done that at any time. Literally, for, like, f for, you know, I mean, $40,000 for a hardware security module and $10,000 for, for one of their own computer science graduates could have quite easily built a system that just printed out QR codes that said, like, Max K got a degree in computer science on this date, and here is his course list, and here is his marks, and everything else, right? They could have done this for decades, and they haven't, right? And the, I think maybe the, the one takeaway from all this is once attestations and identity moves away from states, it will never go back. And if they want to control this, they have one chance, and it is now, and if they don't do it, they will never reclaim, con like, they will, they will just never get it back, because we'll develop private services that do this better, faster, cheaper, more affordably, um, more accessibly, and that give you a better, like, a greater uh, economy of scale. And so, you know, I mean, with this sort of stuff, they missed the boat. It didn't cost them anything to start. They just never wanted to start. And so, anyway, I mean, I guess... We're going to move towards this. It's inevitable. How it looks, I don't know. That's not my area. But, I mean, we've got other people working in this. There's at least a dozen other projects I know around the world working on this sort of stuff. And I'm sure there's more that are in secret. So, you know, it's coming. Um, I just don't know when. Anyone else want to? Awesome. Um, questions? Did you want to finish One more. One more. Um, oh, you think oh shit. Help. Quick, go I'm to stuffed. your thing. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, how might... So one of the things I'm most interested in is how um, crypto might change uh, the housing market. Um, oh, what's this? Do you want to ask a question? No, we're, we're just talking about bio. And bio, bio. okay, yeah, we can jump in. Here we go. So I mean, for those of you... How many alarms do you set off when you go through an airport? Zero. TSA don't know I have any implants. So for those of you who don't know, I'm actually a multiple implantee. Um, right here. Yeah, that's it. On, on my way, on my way. Um, with this digital identity thing, is, is there like, is there ways that this can like not go the way that we want? Is there like, you know, we're talking about universities not adopting this. I think the reason that universities don't adopt this is because it signals their death note. Like once I can put um, verified education information onto a blockchain, I have no need to go to a university anymore. Like I'm a biohacker. Any student that comes through, I can record every hour of study that we do together and anyone can verify that because we've both signed our keys, why would anyone go to a university when they can get a better, better education and convincing someone to tutor them? So I, I think this is, the, personally, this is the reason why I don't think that they're, that they're super keen. 
Um, and do, do you think that there's an opportunity for um, identity theft? So one of the, uh, in fact, we'll just cover this a little bit. So blockchains are kind of secure, but they're secure over a long period of time. When we have countries like uh, China and Russia that are looking to take 80 to 90% of some blockchains with the 51% group that try and take over blockchains, once it's recorded on the blockchain, it's truth. Are we, are we building blockchains that stop that from happening and how might blockchains be subject to abuse in the future? That's a good but question. But we're, not, we're not actually just dealing with small, single pieces of information that we have in the past where it's been very easy to steal that and replicate. We're actually talking about millions of different data <coughs> components that actually make up who you are. So to be able to replicate that over 51% across all nodes and to be able to then do that across all of the data touch points, it, it's, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty tr tricky to do. Not if you're a country. Well, maybe. And on, on, that, yeah. on that note, uh, I might just jump in. Uh, so with, with, with quant <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> well, it is tricky to do now. It is tricky to do. But like with quantum, with quantum computers, machine learning and, and government funds... It's not impossible, and there, there is there, so fifty-one percent are this group of hackers that look for nascent blockchains, and they mine fifty-one percent of the tokens, and they hard fork it, and say we've taken all your coins, we've changed all your rules. If you want it back, give us money. So it's ransomware on the blockchain. So you can do it. You couldn't do it with Bitcoin, but you could do it with some other ones that are just starting up. So they are subject to abuse, and the newer they are, and whenever they hard fork, they are subject to abuse. How do, how do you think that future blockchains might get around that? Are there ways? Yeah, I just want to make a quick comment on the bio side, biometric side. Obviously, on one hand, biometrics, uh, fingerprints, is very easy to steal and you cannot replace them. But other things like uh, Data Citroen recently did some interesting research in gate based authentication. So, everybody's way of working is very unique and you can easily identify you. Actually, if you take a video of this panel walking around and post it on YouTube anonymously, uh, people can reverse engineer who took that video because the way you walk around and take the video is unique to you as well. And the other thing, that is very difficult to replicate and steal, and it's continuous uh, low overhead uh, authentication. Another one we sort of worked on very interestingly is the way you breathe into your microphone uh, is also unique. Obviously, if you got sick, it's a bit different and needs to be retrained, but it's pretty predictive on um, uh, your uh, uh, you know, identity. And that's also another way that uh, you can build identity around it. Yeah. Can we talk about some cool stuff? Like, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, okay so, so one really cool idea. Uh, so we had a speaker at the Student Ethereum on Thursday, who awesome guy, um, Vince Memes, M-E-E-N-I-S. If you look up his, some of his podcast interviews, they're really cool. So one idea he threw out um, on Thursday, he works at a, um, a big campus in the Netherlands and runs a blockchain incubator. And he said one thing they've done on the campus is they've actually added every single tree on the campus onto the blockchain with the GPS location and then paired it to, I think, staff's um, phones. So every time a staff walks past a tree, the trees have their own wallet address. And so a micro fee goes to the tree. So every time you walk past the tree and you kind of, you kind of get some social benefit from it, from, you know, it's, oh, it's a nice tree. You're actually, you're actually, you're actually paying it. And so when it gets enough, enough, uh, enough credits, enough tokens in its uh, wallet, it can actually start paying to plant new trees. So that's pretty cool, like itself. And on that idea, that, um, um, maybe you haven't heard of this one, but uh, so, so we're moving towards the advent of self-driving cars. Um, well, the cool thing about smart contracts in the blockchain is that objects that aren't humans can have their own wallet address. So imagine a self-driving car that is basically driving around, picking up people, picking up passengers, like a, like a self-driving Uber. Um, it's, it's charging passengers. It's collecting that, those payments into its own wallet address. It now runs itself. It can now pay for its own maintenance. It can pay for its own services. It can have a, a system in place where if it ever gets stuck, it can do a call out because it's paying some guy an insurance fee who comes out and picks it up if it's, if it's, if it's trapped. Um, it can even like, buy a new car to add to its fleet. So you can have self-driving cars that own themselves, <laughs> which is really cool. And then, and then I, I was like, well, why stop there? Why not have houses that own themselves? Like, part of the reason why the housing crisis is so ridiculous is because humans own them. And when humans own them, <laughs> when humans own things and they control it, I mean, it becomes an exploitative thing. It becomes, I mean, houses are flipped. They're speculated. I mean, any of you that own property investment, you're only owning it because you think it's going to go up in value so you can flip it. Um, shouldn't housing be a human right? Shouldn't it be something where, you know, it's, it's rather, than, rather than being used by humans to exploit and make a personal profit, it should be for the benefit of all? Well, algorithms don't typically tend to want to fuck over humans. 
yet. Um, <laughs> so if houses owned themselves, that'd be really cool. They could actually like operate at bare minimum cost with no profit, just, pay, just charge enough to maintain themselves, to pay for themselves, to upgrade themselves, that sort of thing. And then on top of that, another idea is uh, who's heard of like decentralized autonomous organizations? So it's a similar thing, DAOs, DAOs, not the DAO. The DAO was just uh, one implementation of that that kind of got notoriety because it got hacked and raised a bunch of money. But uh, DAO, like the acronym DAO, is really cool. So Vitalik's written a lot about that. Um, and it's just basically the idea of having uh, essentially entities that live on the blockchain, almost like, uh, like ghost in the shell entities, like when, you, when they deep dive the web and they're just, they're just living there. So this is when you merge like AI, smart contracts, DAOs and the blockchain, we'll have like these entities that literally have their own self-perpetuating means, they add value and they make their own money and they're actually, they're run away, they can't be stopped. So they, they'll be really bad DAOs, they'll be really good DAOs. Um, <laughs> I think essentially replace, I actually think eventually you'll replace every single, if you look at every single industry in the world, there'll eventually just be one DAO that runs it all. So insurance industry, why the hell are there like 10,000 different insurance companies with all the people they employ when essentially it could just be run by a smart contract DAO? One single global DAO that just, an insurance DAO. And I've got those domains by the way. Insurance DAO, <laughs> insurance DAO and uh, a whole bunch of other ones. Do you think that so, yeah. blockchain and and Crypto could basically be the answer to a universal basic income. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so one of the reasons I don't like uh, the idea of universal basic income is because if it's issued by a central government, at some point we're going to end up with the elite still owning all the AI and all the automations and all the robotics and all the resources, and 99.9% .9 of us will be living off a of basic so income. It's still welfare, is what you're saying. No, no, if, no. The, if the elites own it, or yeah, yeah. But the issue I have with a, a government issuing a basic income is they control it. So they'll be able to raise or lower the basic income in the future and control the masses. So we need a decentralized basic income that just pays it out without any human being, out, being able and, to control it. And sort it. of works it out on the basis of this is what you need to live, this yep. is what a house should be worth, this is, yep. you know, basically the calc. Yep. On that note, um, who here does cryptocurrency full time? Okay, less than I thought. I know a lot of people who right now, it is already a universal basic income. For them, for those people. For so for people that got in early enough, they basically, a lot of my friends have an unlimited bank account, which is very nice for them. <laughs> well, yeah. restricted mainly by time rather than amount. That's right. So, so, so we do actually have it now, but um, I think what Nathan's saying is very important as well, which is that if a centralized person controls it, then when a new road needs to get built and they haven't got quite enough robots, the or thing. make you work for your money, and have something like Egypt had in uh, 4,000 years ago. Um, I might just wrap it up there. Could I have a, a big round of applause for our panelists? Uh, a big thank you to Academy XI.